Shields up, Iron Breakers. We're kind of here coming at you with another video, and today I'm going to be bringing you my beginner's guide for Rise of the Ronin. This title was sent to me by PlayStation Portugal, so I can give it a look and tell you guys my opinions on it. Now, right now, we're actually in the middle of a mission in the game, and the reasoning behind that is because missions is the only point in time at which we can actually go ahead and swap between characters. And I want to show you guys a couple of things about swapping between characters and how you can use that. That's why we're on a mission. A little bit later in this guide, I'm also going to be showcasing some open world stuff as well as a lot of tips. Now, before we begin, it's also important to mention that my guides tend to be rather lengthy. However, there's usually going to be chapters in the timeline of this video. So you can go ahead and you can scroll through those chapters to click on the section that is most relevant to you You don't necessarily have to watch the whole video even though the video does have a sequential order that kind of makes sense Basically building up on top of mechanics that we talked about previously But you are free to jump to specific mechanics if that is something that you want to do So let's go ahead Jesus, okay, fine. I'm gonna get to it. All right, Jules chill, bro. Anyway, let's get started with the basics. You have your basic attack, which is basically mash square. Gives you like four or five hit combos depending on the weapon. You can change directions. And as you can see, it consumes that little blue gauge on the center of the screen. Now that blue gauge is your key. And key functionally works like stamina. So the whole idea is you use your attacks until you run out of stamina. Stamina is also consumed when you block, which you can do by pressing L1. So blocking and attacking consume stamina. Enemies also have stamina, like let me see if I can actually lock on to one of them. There should be some of them down here. As you can see, also has a stamina gauge. So your objective in combat is going to be destroy the enemy's stamina gauge before he destroys yours. And you know, after that you get to do a critical attack. But anyway, these are your basics, right? Square attacks does this. You can also charge your square attack, which is going to do a different attack depending on the weapon that you have. And you can also press forward and that will also do a different attack as you can see. So this is like your idle attack and this is your forward attack. And different weapons will have different movesets for all of these things. There's also going to be stances. We're going to be talking about those in just a second, but just understand. So you got your basic attack, you got your charged attack, and then you have your forward attack, right? All different things, but these all basically are using the same button, which is square. Whether that is square from idle, square while moving in a direction, or hold square. Now, another thing that you have is a move that allows you to go ahead and recover your key. So I can't really show you the key recovery part of this move, but essentially this works like key pulsing in Neo if you've ever done it. In this game, it is called Blade Flash. So the idea is as you attack more and more, you're going to be consuming your key. But ideally, you're also going to be hitting enemies. And as you hit enemies, blood is going to start pooling on your weapon. There's going to be a gauge that is going to show up on the bottom right-hand side. You guys will see that when we actually go into action. But basically, the idea is the more blood cakes up in your blade, eventually, you're going to want to press the R1 button. And that is going to perform what they call the blade flash. And it works just like a key pulse. So if I do this and then press R1, see how he did that move right there? So that will actually recover your key based on the amount of blood that you have in your weapon. If you actually look on the bottom left hand side, you can now see that there's a, a little gray gauge at the bottom of the weapon. That gauge will be filled with yellow the more blood of your enemies starts pooling on the weapon. The more that is there and the more you shake off using this blade flash, the more key you will recover. So the idea is you start attacking an enemy slash slash slash. You're running through all of your key and then eventually when you start running out you'll want to stop and do this to recover that key. This also works by you swapping into a different weapon and doing a bunch of other things. We're going to be talking about that in just a second, because before that, we need to talk about parrying. So parrying is done by pressing triangle. And basically, you want to time this as an attack is about to land on you. This is going to require a significant amount of practice, and this game is going to require you to parry quite often. Can you play the game without parrying? Maybe in the easier difficulties you can, but in the higher difficulties, you probably cannot. I'm, I would find very hard to play this game without parrying at all. So I would recommend that you get familiar with it. Like I said, just press triangle, right as a hit is about to land on you. This is also an attack, so it'll also deal damage even if you miss, but it is not something that you want to use as an attack. Usually if you want to attack, you want to attack with square. However, 
after you start parrying people, one of the things that's going to happen is eventually you're gonna break their gauge, you're gonna break their key. And at that point, triangle is also used as a critical attack. So if you come up on an enemy, press triangle, you're going to execute a visceral blow, which I will show you guys in a second. This is also used for stealth assassination. So if you're able to sneak up on an enemy, which by the way, you can press L3 to crouch, which makes you a lot stealthier. If you can sneak up on an enemy and you press triangle before he can actually see you, there will actually be a red indicator when you can do this. Your character is just going to go ahead and, you know, try to assassinate him. Now, different enemies are going to take more damage than others because some of the enemies are quite simply stronger. So, you know, it is what it is. Now, I told you previously that if you press L1, you're going to go into a block. And this is just a tip that I want to give you guys when it comes to parrying. If you are trying to parry, my recommendation is hold down the block button. Why? Because that case, if you miss the timing on the parry, you're going to be blocking. So if you parry too soon and the enemy's attack takes too long, you will still be blocking when the enemy hits you. If you parry too late, you're still going to block. So it's just a win-win. There's no reason not to parry, not to block when you are trying to parry. As a matter of fact, it's become such second nature to me that even when I'm just trying to parry a one-off hit, I'll even press the block button while I'm trying to parry. It's not a problem. does not delay you at all. So just hold down block, which is L1 and then try to parry. That would be my recommendation. It makes it a little bit easier for you guys to parry. Now, you can also swap weapons. You're able to equip two weapons. If we go onto the equipment menu, we can actually see right here. This is my main weapon, the bayonet. I'm just using the katana because probably more people are gonna be using katanas. But, you know, I have a bayonet and I can actually go ahead and I can swap to the bayonet by pressing R1 and up. Press R1 and up, swaps weapons again. So you can keep swapping between two weapons if that is something that you want to do. Different weapons, different movesets, different martial skills. These are things that I feel like I don't really have to explain to you the advantage of using multiple weapons, even though if I'm going to be completely honest, this is the only weapon I use. I just use bayonet. I never swap weapons. But there are advantages to swapping weapons, such as you can do a blade flash when swapping a weapon. They call these flash attacks. So say, for instance, you're going all out with your katana and you run out of your combo. And then when you run out of your combo, you can go ahead and you can press R1 and up D-pad and it is going to swap to your other weapon and do an attack while it does it. And this also recovers your key based around the amount of blood that you have on your weapon, just like we mentioned previously. Then you can do the same thing in the other direction if that is something that you want to do, as you can see. You just swap weapon. The way that you do this is R1 and up D-pad in the middle of a combo. This does an attack and it recovers your key. I know that you guys are not seeing the key recovery here, and that is because you need to actually be hitting enemies in order to be able to recover your key. But as you can imagine, trying to explain all these mechanics whilst hitting enemies is gonna be pretty annoying. Now beyond that, there's also something called combat styles. If you hold down on R1, you'll notice that right now we are in the Mumio Ryu um, combat style. This is your basic combat style. This is the combat style that you begin with. And you can also see on top of it that it says Jin. Now, if we go ahead and we, as we press R1, we flick the right stick down, that is going to swap us to Shinto Munen Ryu. You might have different combat styles associated with these because these are fully customizable. I'll show you guys how to do it. But you'll also notice that this one says 10. And then you have another one on the right side, which says Chi, which in my case is Hokushin Itoriyo. Now, these are all different combat styles. And these also give you access to different movesets, as you guys can see. Swapping between your combat style, very much like swapping between a weapon, will also execute a blade flash, which they call here a violent gale. I don't know why they feel the need to call these things all different things, but it's basically an attack that also recovers your key. So say, for instance, you're in the middle of attacking an enemy, and then you want to go and you swap. It'll also do an attack. I'm not sure if you guys could see that. Right there, I swapped styles and also did a little bit of an attack, and it will also recover your key. However, in my opinion, this is not something that you're going to be doing very often. And the reasoning is styles actually are a rock, paper, paper, scissors. So if we actually target an enemy right there, which you can see, you'll notice that it has white arrows up and down. This means that right now we are in a neutral combat style. So that means you don't have an advantage and the enemy doesn't have an advantage on you. It is neutral. 
However, if we hold down R1, you'll notice now on the bottom left uh, right hand side of the screen that you can actually see uh, that there's going to be red arrows. So in this case, if we swap to Moon in uh, Mumio Ryu, this attack is actually going to be disadvantageous for us. So the enemy will be dealing more key damage and we will be dealing less key damage. So this is a bad idea to use this moveset. On the other hand, if you swap to the right one, which is Chi, the Hokin Shin Ito Ryu, this is going to give us an advantage. Basically, the idea here is do not memorize the number of the combat styles. Just look at the little arrows on the bottom right hand side and you should be able to get it. Neutral, advantageous, bad. So because this works very much like rock, paper, scissors, what you want to do is just select whichever is the advantageous fighting style and then hack your enemy to pieces in most situations. Now, there's also some strange styles that I don't have a whole lot of experience with at this point. If we actually go into combat styles, I'll, I'll go into further detail about this, but just to give you guys an idea, we actually go over here and we swap a style and let's say we put one of these, which if you notice there, style type, it says Shinobi. So this style type is actually quite unique in that it should be advantageous if you time your counters properly, so it's very good for parrying, but at the same time, it's going to be disadvantageous on everything else, as far as I can tell. Because, like, if I target the enemy... Oh, man. They're all far away. I'm trying to target that dude down there. Come on, bro. There we go. If we actually go to the Shinobi mode, notice how it says, Okay, this is going to be disadvantageous. But the advantage of using these modes is that they're going to give you unique movesets that you can't access any other way. Now, personally, I usually stick with the chi ten jin styles and it should be slightly easier if you're also just starting out if you're a beginner but at the same time my primary weapon that i use all the time i only have three combat styles so i can't really do much else but just be aware that those styles do exist and they are slightly different but you know it is what it is so the idea here is as you are fighting enemies you're going to swap to the advantageous style you go ahead you hack them up with whatever move set you feel like doing whether that's a charge attack your frontal moving attacks whatever you do your blade flashes to recover key and just keep up the pressure until you're able to break them down naturally try to parry as much as you can like I said, you hold down block, you press triangle whenever you are getting attacked, and you try to parry as much as you can because that is going to burn through their key gauge quite fast, and it is also going to put them in a panic mode. Now, another thing that you have available to you are going to be martial skills, which you can access by pressing R1 and then pressing square, which in this case you get the this move for this style but the thing is the martial skills change based on the combat style you're at so this is r1 square for chi and then this is r1 square for 10 so it's going to be different sometimes they have follow-up attacks which as you can see in this case you can just keep going until you know it runs out and this is probably going to deal a ton of damage then you also have the same thing but for triangle which is going to be a different attack which, as you can see, this is what you do. And again, these attacks are going to differ based on the weapon that you're using and based on the combat style that you're using. So this one would be for the Moomin Ryu, the triangle attack. And eventually, you're also going to unlock more. So in the case of this Hokin Shin Ito Ryu, I have three martial skills, which you can see again, bottom right-hand side. And this would be R1 plus X, which is one of the new attacks which looks very similar to the other one, but it is different, and it is an infinite combo as well. I will talk more about how to unlock more attacks, but at the beginning, you'll only have R1 plus square and triangle, and then eventually, as you play the game more, you're going to unlock R1 plus X, and eventually even R1 plus circle. Like I said, I'll explain these a little bit better and how you can unlock them a little bit further ahead in the video. For now, I just want you to be aware that these are things that you can do, and one of the things is, when the enemy panics, they get uh, a red glow around their uh, health bar. That is when you want to use your martial skills because they're going to deal more key damage. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, furthermore, there's another mechanic still that you can have in the form of the grappling rope. So the grappling rope is something that you can throw by pressing R2. 
And there are several things that you can do with this. Sometimes there will be barrels next to enemies and you can hold down R2 and it will actually grab and throw the barrels at them, which will be very advantageous. Sometimes you might have enemies on rooftops that you can't get to. Press R2, that's going to pull them down and you'll be able to punish that. And also you can use it as a gap closer. If you jump and then press R2, your character will actually yeet himself towards the enemies. Although, to be quite honest, I don't tend to use any of these all that often. The one that I do use, however, is the one where you can go ahead and you can use this to do stealth assassinations, and I will show you guys how to do that soon enough. Just be aware that the rope is there as well. Now, when it comes to ranged options, if you notice, when you press R1, you have down D-pad there for the weapons. If we have a regular weapon like a rifle or a bow, you can just hold down R2. It aims, shoots, very good for starting engagements or killing enemies that are too far away from you to deal with. However, if you swap the weapon, if you happen to equip a revolver like I do, you can also just press L2 to shoot. Just really, really cool. I love it. I think this is a ton of fun. Then you can also reload it by pressing down on R1 and L2. And this will reload it, and then you can keep shooting. Just remember, these bullets are limited, so eventually you'll need to come up onto one of these to go ahead and reload. And this will also use bullets from like your, uh, from your storage and stuff like that. So you'll eventually have to buy those at stores and so on and so forth. But you know, now you kind of get the idea of what are the basics of combat. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to swap to my rifle. This is my preferred playstyle. The reason why I didn't show this rifle is because the charge attacks on the rifle are all shots. So it's kind of like weird for a lot of people if you're not playing the rifle and you just think that charge attacks or all shots or whatever but you know it is what it is that's all of the combat uh stuff with the exception of one final thing which is swapping between characters so whenever you are in a mission if you happen to bring characters with you which i did there's these two characters jules and ryoma here with me uh, jules is like the captain america looking guy he's french but basically what you do is you press down on L1 and you notice that you have up D-pad and down D-pad as symbols. So if you press down, you're going to swap to Ryoma. If you press uh, down again, you're going to swap to Jules. Notice as you swap character, it's constantly swapping which button it is that you need to press. But the idea here is swapping characters give you a massive advantage. You might be wondering, well, why? Because say you're fighting a boss and the boss is aggroed on this character that I have right here. And he's just like pressuring me like all hell. I can go ahead, swap to Ryoma, go up behind the boss, hack away at him. And then he's eventually going to swap to Ryoma. And then I swap the jewels over here and I hack away at the boss. So you can really use this to put the pressure on bosses. Now, this doesn't just make for super duper easy mode, but it does give you a lot of advantage because let's say you can go up to a boss, unload your entire key gauge, and then not even bother to recover. Swap to another character, keep unloading, right? And then swap to another character, keep unloading. And depending on which character has aggro, you can even just be like, okay, this character has aggro now, and I'm going to swap to this one. Continue attacking. Notice I haven't stopped attacking yet. And then swap again, continue attacking. Swap again, continue pressuring. Swap again. You can even use, like, martial skills and stuff if you want to, right? Right? You just go in, start attacking. Boom, boom, boom. Swap another character. Keep attacking. It is brutal. You can really put a lot of pressure on bosses doing this. So... Keep that in mind, as it is a very important mechanic. Also, in missions, if you happen to die, one of the other two characters will take over. You'll start playing that character, and you can resurrect yourself by using one of the healing pills. Speaking of healing pills, if you go over to equipment and we press uh, down all the way to where items is, all of this is uh, customizable, so you can swap to do whatever items you want. One of my recommendations would be also put healing elixirs on here. So the medicinal pills, this is one of the refreshable materials, so you can use these. And then whenever you rest at a bonfire equivalent, you're going to get these back. However, um, you know eventually you can run out of them and if you do you also have the healing elixirs to make up for that that's why i have this no pills here healing elixirs here i have the horse whistle here this is mostly for open world stuff and then we have this detector this is going to be something that you unlock a little bit later in the game just keep following through the main storyline and eventually you're going to unlock this but the detector is actually something that you can use to detect enemies behind walls it uses a system of echolocation to go ahead and do that so you know, it's also very useful when you are trying to do stealth and stuff. 
But anyway, let's actually get on to the mission now that I've uh, talked plenty. And let me show you guys how I would go ahead and I would tackle this. So you have quite a lot of enemies around. One of the important things is, if you notice on the top left-hand side, you'll see there, optional defeat formidable foes. So one of the things that you want to try and do is identify where the formidable foes are. So the way that you can do that is you can actually swap to your ranged weapon. So in this case, I'm going to be using a rifle. You just aim and it shows you like different uh, rankings on top of them. And if you see the ranking like the one in this guy that I'm aiming at, that is the ranking of a formidable foe right there. So that guy is going to be a lot tougher than all of the other ones. All of the other ones you can probably assassinate in one shot. This guy, not so much. He's going to take a little bit more of work. So keep that in mind. But the advantage is as you defeat these formidable foes, the other foes lose morale. So it becomes easier to go ahead and kill them. So anyways, let's jump onto the rooftop down here. You can glide, so you can just press X while you're in the middle of the air. And that also is going to break your fall so that you don't take fall damage. Actually, I didn't even have to do that. Now, one of the really cool things about Rise of Ronin is that if you are on rooftops, very few enemies can actually see you. So I can just approach this guy. And I can actually yank him with the rope. And he's dead. You just press R2. He's gone. So that guy's dead. And not only he's dead, he's also on top of a roof. So they're not really... Go oh, did he fall down? I think he just straight up disappeared. But anyways, because you didn't kill him where everybody could see him, nobody else is going to be alerted either, which is pretty good. Now, another thing that you can do is you can do aerial assassination. So I can actually glide up to one of these dudes. And we just assassinate him from here by pressing triangle. The other dude's going to panic, so you press triangle again. And you're going to kill him too. See, that's not a problem. If you actually pressed triangle a little bit faster, you would have killed both of them with assassination moves. Now, there's a dude coming. We're going to go ahead. We're going to hide here in the bush. Do not worry about NPCs seeing your companions. They actually can't see them. They can only see the player character, so that's not a problem. Whoop. That guy saw a dead body. Uh-oh. Oh, no. What happened here? I'm so scared. Oh, no. You're going to basically wait. You're going to sneak around. And... Aww. He actually detected me, so we're going to have to engage in combat. There, we broke him. And now we can actually press R2. Oh, no, wait. Damn it, I messed that up. My bad. I want it to be all fancy, and I forgot that I equipped the rifle earlier. There is this memberment, by the way. For some reason, that appears to be a big thing. A lot of people weren't aware that was the case because the promotional material didn't show it. So that guy's coming over. We're going to go ahead. We're going to hide in the tall grass again. You can wait for him to pass, or you can just attack him. You can do whatever. It's really not that big of a deal. By the way, that uh, aerial grab that I did with the rope, that requires a skill. I'll show you guys in a bit what that skill is. If they actually come close enough to the tall grass, you can actually kill them and pull them inside the grass so that they're not detected, which is also very good. But let's go ahead and keep going. One of the things when it comes to formidable foes is that you usually want to see if you can like score a, a cheesy assassination on them before you actually begin the fight and do remember enemies near enemies that you happen to uh assassinate they usually become panicked so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna fly up to that formidable foe i'm gonna stab him with an assassination and immediately press triangle again to try and assassinate the guy that's next to him So actually, he didn't panic for some reason. This guy was a little bit tougher than usual. Now, notice how he has the advantage on me. Even though I am parrying. So what you want to do is you want to swap styles. So right now, if I swap to the Chi style, I'll have the advantage. And now I'm going to go ahead and yeet him into the wall using my rope. And he's dead. You can use the rope to yeet people into walls. That's another skill that you can unlock. Now... Our style is also advantageous against the big guy, but we have this dude over here, so I'm going to go ahead and swap to a style that's advantageous against him. Always remember to blade flash to recover your key. I was trying to parry, but... This guy's moveset is annoying as hell. Now let's go ahead and swap back to my revolver. Looks like they killed the big boy, but we did the assassination on him, which made him significantly easier. But basically the whole point of this is that in this game, unlike Neo, wherein they kind of like have these levels that are pretty much meant to be tackled a certain way, you have the same freedom where you would have something in, in something like a Sekiro, where you can kind of like figure out ways to 
come at enemies from the top, from the bottom, or, you know, just different approaches. Now, when you have a ranged enemy like that, my recommendation is actually just swap to a rifle, pop his head off, problem solved. It's not going to bother you anymore. Although sometimes that does cause you to be detected, like in here. Once again, swap your style to be advantageous. Do pay attention to when enemies do their red attacks, because you can only really... Oh, we're going to get in the mess situation. You can only really parry those. You can't really, like, block them. Let me go ahead and swap to my revolver. I want to do a revolver assassination. I love these. Boom. You just press L2 if you have a revolver. Uh, although you need to unlock this also in your skills, but it's so much fun. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to heal here. As you can see, there's also like detection rings whenever something detects you. You should be somewhat familiar with these. It's not really a big deal. Let's go ahead and open this door. I thought I had already gotten this treasure chest. But maybe I didn't when I did the mission the first time around. Yeah, of course you will. Because I'm the boss. So we have a couple of more, en more enemies to go through here. But fundamentally, you guys get the idea of how to run around in stealth and how to actually engage in combat. I can even just like... Go straight up to the middle of this guy. Oh, he's blocking. Stop that. I guess I forgot to mention that circle is dodge, but that should be, like, <laughs> instinctive at this point. Bang. I love shooting them point blank like that. It's so much fun. Let's go ahead and swap to a style that's advantageous for us. Break the shield, kill this guy. Uh, who's still shooting at me? Oh, there's a archer up there. I'm gonna swap to a rifle and pop him. No, actually, no, we're gonna do something different. See, when you have an archer like this, you can just go up to him and just be like, Oi, come here, bro. What the hell? For some reason. Gotta walk on. Boink. And then you can just stab him as he falls down, too. But yeah, that's R2 for your rope. All right. Did we kill everything? We did. Okay. I am a little bit over leveled for this mission. Keep that in mind. Now let's actually just go. Th oh, we have to go from the other side. Okay. Let me go up there then. All over the place, you'll also find these, which are grappling points that allow you to just go up. This is very much similar to something like a Sekiro if you've played that. Oh, here's the entrance. And there should be a boss fight in here. This is not really too spoilery, but this is also a really cool mission. Oh, we're actually on the wrong side. We have to go around to the other side. Let's go through here. Where's the entrance to this place? Ha. You'll want to raise the banners whenever you see those. They also refresh your potions and stuff like that. There's usually whenever you see one of these dudes in the middle of a, a mission usually means that the boss is right afterwards because that's always been how it goes with me so i'm gonna jump in here it's a boss fight we're gonna go ahead and we'll fight him as you can see we already have the advantageous uh combat style so we'll just stick with that but like i said one of the things that you can do we can go ahead and swap characters whenever things get a little bit uh, complicated, so you can really just abuse that. See? I don't even know how to play a lot of these characters, because I haven't played like this in a while. But this is just to show you how much you can go and do. See how you can just, like abuse this mechanic. Like, oh, you're attacking that guy? Oh, that's a damn shame. Why did we swap the katana, by the way? Although, timing parries is also very satisfying, which is why I've been trying to focus on that more and more. Whoa, that's a lot of damage there, buddy. Another thing that I also find cool is to just shoot him with a revolver. I still struggle a little bit with dual blades. Bang. 
Well, I'm afraid you don't have much of a choice, buddy. Oh, God. He stabbed me. Now, if you notice, the blade gauge right now is full, so whenever I use my blade flash, it's going to recover a lot. The timing on these is uh, pretty vicious, but once you start getting it down, it becomes a lot easier. Anyway, we finished the mission. I'm going to skip this cutscene because I don't want you guys to be watching cutscenes and stuff. Can we uh, go ahead and skip this, please? So, this is where we're at right now. And you can see that there are characters here. This location is called your longhouse. This is kind of like your, your home. We'll talk a little bit more about this. But before we do that, I've shown you guys some action, some stealth, all of that good stuff. I wanted to show you guys uh, about your stats, as well as weapon proficiency, combat styles, how you can go about uh, collecting that stuff. So let's go ahead and do that. So your equipment is a fairly basic thing, pretty much like it's been in pretty much every other game. You have your two weapons. These are the weapons that you can swap between. You can choose from a wide variety of them. There's no Odachis, dual blades. Uh, there's this Chinese sword, great swords, uh, what's this thing called? The bayonet. There's a bunch of stuff for you to swap between if you want to try out different weapons. Then you have your sub weapons, which you have bows, rifles, revolvers. You also have these, um, balls, which are kind of like distraction things. You have a shuriken, which I haven't really used. And you also have a flamethrower for reasons. But yeah, that's a thing. You can also use those, play around with those. They're fun, but... Usually I stick with revolver and rifle, so I'm gonna keep it that. Your armor, same thing. You know, you just look at stats, see whatever you want. There's going to be set items. You can press uh, triangle to see what the set does. If you collect more, um, you know, more part, more pieces of that set. There's one, two, three, four pieces of armor, which is your head piece, your chest piece, as well as legs. So like your whole body piece comes in one go. You have gloves and you have boots or in this case, slippers. Then you have up to four accessories. Right now, we only have three unlocked. There's still one of them locked, which I have to play the game some more in order to unlock. Then you have your items that you can kind of like customize however you see fit. You can just go to loadout, customize these, you know, super simple stuff. But then you have stats, and this is where things get a little bit interesting because initially, you know, I figured, oh, I want to do a dexterity build because I realized dexterity was going to be what scales off of bayonets the most. But the reality is you don't want to limit yourself to just doing one build because you're going to need points in all of these. Now, I'm going to let you guys figure out for yourselves what type of build you want to do, but I will give you some recommendations. So, for instance, in strength, having repel arrows and bullets is not too bad because this also sets your blade on fire, and it's just cool to repel, so it's kind of like a nice little mechanic. Mitter, counter spark, it's not really super important, but I needed it to get this. Refill medicinal pills. Now, I would recommend you go through all of these and find one of those because they all have it. As you can see on the dexterity, here it is as well. Refill medicinal pills. If we go to charm, you can see it right here. Refill medicinal pills. And if you go to intellect, it should also be somewhere around here. Uh, right here. Refill medicinal pills. So, the reason you want to get this is because medicinal pills, the, the refill portion of it, is going to be the amount of essentially Estus flasks that you are going to get whenever you rest at one of these, right? So right now you can see that I have four. I'm gonna go ahead, oops, touch the wrong thing. I'm gonna go ahead, touch the banner. Boom, now I have eight. So you wanna make sure that you grab as many of these as possible. Refill medicinal pills. Now, this is going to require sometimes different types of skills because there's skill points and then there's strength points and then there's dexterity points and then there's charm points. These are all going to be given to you by completing stuff out in the open world and finding these scrolls, which I don't know if I have any right now. I don't, I only have a treatise on enlightenment, but eventually you'll find some of these treatises that will give you like, oh, a treatise on charisma, a treatise on intelligence, and you can use that and you gain additional points. But essentially it's just do stuff, gain points. Do missions, do open world activities, do all of that, find treasures, and you'll eventually find more of these points. Now, like I said, repelling bullets, good stuff. Refilling, good stuff. Key attack, that's also nice, it's not really mandatory. Uh, increased critical hit damage, highly recommend this one, very, very good. Auto life recovery out of battle, this is also nice, but this is mostly for open world, because in missions you don't really recover. 
Uh, Speechcraft Intimidate. This will give you more options as to whenever you are uh, in dialogue with other characters. I would highly recommend you to get this one as well. There's also another one in Charm, which I think is either Persuade or Liar. Liar. Speechcraft Liar. This one will also give me more options in dialogues and in Intellect there is also one which is Speechcraft Persuade. Now, you can put more points in these, uh, but just to get the dialogue option, you only need one point, and it doesn't really increase, like, your chances of succeeding or not. It just gives you the option, and that's it. Adding more points just increases the passive effect, which is, like, in this case, um, reduces the price of stuff that you can buy uh, at shops and also gives you more money for things that you sell. In the case of Charm, it would be... Uh, Increases the amount of time enemies remain panicked. And for the exter dexterity, doesn't have one. And then for strength, it increases the morale. It, uh, no, wait, that's not it. Which one is it? It increases the amount of time that enemies remain cowering. This is whenever you stab somebody and the enemies panic, they remain cowering for longer. These are things that I would recommend you to get uh, just for the effect of having additional... Uh, options during dialogue, which could be important for your own roleplay purposes and whatnot, because it will influence certain decisions that you get to make in the game. Another one that I would recommend would be the, where is it? The Grappling Rope Assassination, which like I told you earlier, I used one of these. This is super, this is like, this would be the first thing that I would get. Knowing what I know now, this would literally be the first thing that I would work towards. Grappling Rope Assassination. It is so good. I've used it so often. Another one that's good, Full Sprint Assassination. That's also very good, but you know, it is what it is. There's plenty of stuff for you to get but the ones that i've mentioned so far i would consider to be the most important ones so keep that in mind that's your stats your equipment now let's talk a little bit more about combat style right so let's say for instance you're starting the game and the only combat style that you have is momio ryu because that is the one that you start with and you're like oh how do i get more combat styles and whenever you hover over one of these, it is going to tell you what you need to do. Now, in my case, I've already unlocked all of them, but usually it would just show up in here and will tell you, oh, you got to go kill this fugitive, and it would tell you the name of the fugitive. And at that point, what you would do is you would open up your map, and fugitives have an icon that looks like... Where is it? Where is the fugitive? Like this. This would be a fugitive icon. So... You just identify which fugitive you need to kill, and then you go over there and you kill him, and you get his combat skill. These aren't too hard. It's just like a mini boss fight almost. You kill him, you get your stuff. Not only you can get combat styles from this, you can also get additional proficiency for your weapon, as well as a bunch of other stuff. But these you'll be able to get fairly easy, like within the first 15 hours or so of the game. Like I said, you just go in here and it will tell you what you have to do. But one of the things that you will notice afterwards is like, okay, so the Kihei Tai style for my bayonet has the uh, martial skills Rampaging Lion and Ankle Cracker. But it also has Spring Rain. And it's, you know, it's grayed out. What, what do I have to do? And it tells you right there. You press triangle to gain access to that style. Go to the skill and it tells you train with question, question, question to unlock. What this means is I haven't really met the character that I need to train with in order to unlock this skill. If we then go through and we press square, it will also tell you in order to upgrade this, you need to go ahead and gain bond level with a certain character that we haven't encountered yet. Whenever this happens, just means go do more side quests, go do more main quests until you meet this character. And when you meet this character, follow through with quests that they give you. These quests will usually look, uh, will have a symbol kind of like this, which as you can see, this is a quest that is tied to uh, our buddy Ryoma. I mean, you can't see because you probably don't know he's Ryoma, but you'll learn. Ryoma is the first character that you meet. So this is not spoilers or anything, but just be aware, the, these are usually like characters tied to a specific quest, and you'll want to make sure that you do these because these increase the bond and all of that good stuff with that character. Now, that's how you unlock combat styles, martial skills, and all of that stuff, whether that is defeat fu certain fugitive and then just raise your bond. Now, let me actually show you some weapons wherein I can see where the bond is at. So, for instance, right here, this one's already fully upgraded, which is why we have the autumn current skill. Uh, but if we go here, 
we have this one that tells you you got to go and get the bond level up of Yukichi Fukuzawa. And now you guys might be wondering, well, how do I get the bond up? And that is where gifts come in because this game has this whole social system in the game where if we go through and we enter our longhouse, you'll notice that there are characters in my longhouse. So if we go ahead and we go to talk, you can see that we have Usugu, Usugu Mudayu. She is a cat lady. This, this lady actually levels up by you just finding cats out in the world. Then we have Matthew Perry. I know this one's a little bit weird, uh, but yeah, you'll eventually get him as a companion. And then you have Ryoma Sakamoto, which to be honest, this is a little bit immersion breaking. The fact that you have Matthew Perry and Ryoma Sakamoto who are kind of like in opposing factions and they're both just hanging out in my house it's a little bit weird but whatever not really a big deal so the idea here is you want to talk to these characters and develop relationships so let's say for instance ryoma sakamoto gives me stuff for the katana but i already have it maxed out but matthew perry gives you stuff for the saber so you go and you talk with him and you can just go ahead and say hey i got something for you and you can give him a gift now an important thing about gifts is if you notice, some of the gifts have like a little heart symbol on the lower left-hand side corner. Now, the Knot of Destiny is a universal gift. It's kind of like, uh, I give you this and this raises you loads, right? So this one will work on everybody and it is like the most powerful bond raising item. But then you also have this, which in his case, Matthew Perry likes his whiskey so i can go ahead and i can give him whiskey and it will raise his bond with me significantly there might be other presents here no in the case of matthew perry there's nothing else that he really likes so you shouldn't give him stuff that doesn't have the heart because that's a waste because other characters might like that specific item so for instance the ball of yarn here or tamari ball whatever you call this this works obviously with the cat lady that i have on here so if i go ahead and i talk with her and I just go like, hey, I got like these uh, cat balls for you. Oh, she also likes uh, face powder and brush. She always likes, also likes yukabuku. But tamari ball is probably something that only she likes. Perfect. So this is going to raise her bond significantly, as you can see there. And then eventually you can talk to them and they might have specific things that advance the relationship between you and that character. Which in this case we didn't get enough, but this is how you level up bonds between characters. Pay attention to notice the little heart icon on it, because that is going to be a dead giveaway as to whether they like it or not. Now... Another thing about your longhouse, and I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, I don't care about decorating the longhouse. But the thing is, this gives you passive bonuses. So it is definitely something that you want to do. For instance, so you have a place to put a weapon. In my case, as you can see, there is a bayonet there. And you might be wondering why. The reasoning is whatever weapon you put on there is going to increase the drop rate for that weapon by 0.2%. So, and by the way, if you guys hear noise in the background, my kids are running around the warehouse, my apologies. But anyway, as I was saying, um, as you can see, we put a rifle on there. This increases the percentage. If you are somebody who is using, like, say, uh, the pole arm, you just grab any of these pole arms, you put it on there. That is going to increase the chance of the game just dropping you more pole arms. It's a little bit, it's only 0.2%, but it's better than nothing, and it's free. There's no disadvantage to doing it. So definitely go ahead and do that. Then you also have a hanging scroll. This also gives you passive benefits. In this case, this gives me more proficiency for my weapons. There's also one that'll give you more coin acquisition. There's one that gives you additional item drops from enemies. So it's really just pick whatever you want, put it on there, get the bonuses. And then you have accessories. And in here, these decide which characters are going to visit you more. So because I, if I was to put a, a because I have a boat here, that's probably the reason why Matthew Perry is hanging around. It is because I have a boat and this increases the frequency of people who like mar maritime adventure. You know, then I also have this, which increases the, the frequency for, for people who like Japanese confections, so on and so forth. But basically this allows you to decide who are the people that come to your house. The armor doesn't really do anything, so that's not really a big deal. But all of these other ones are going to be things that you're going to want to do. Now, on top of that, the more cats you find throughout the open world activities, you're going to be able to send them out on missions. Uh, this is kind of like those mobile games, right? Where you just send 
uh, you just send your cats out on missions to go get stuff for you. So in an hour, like these cats will come back and they will give me stuff. Uh, I just usually send them on whatever. You can see the rewards. They're going to be random rewards. You can see them on the bottom right hand side. But I'm always just sending them. But I don't really engage with this system that much. Just be aware that it's there in case you want to use this for anything. Then there's also pilgrim dogs. Whenever you send out your dog, uh, you can send them with some uh, coin. In my, in this case, I'm actually going to send them like 3,000. This one I find not to be worth it because you spend a lot of money. Usually I just use it as a dump. So whenever I don't, I have loads of cash, I'm just going to be like, okay, I'm going to burn some cash by sending out the dog. He brings you out materials and stuff. And if you encounter these dogs out in the world, you can pet them and you'll also get materials. And I assume that the owner of the dog, because sometimes you run into dogs from other players, I assume that the owner of the dog will get some gold, and, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, it is important to decorate your house, do your cat concierge and pilgrim dogs. Is, meh, if you want to do it, go right ahead, it's whatever. And also remember to talk with these characters if you want to go ahead and advance the relationships, particularly if you need it for the combat styles and all of that good stuff. There's also a cooperation menu in case you want to engage in multiplayer. This is fairly box standard stuff. I haven't actually been able to join random players, so I don't know if it's because we're still in the review period, what the deal with that is going to be. It's whatever, really. But finally, there's the Testament of the Soul. This is something that allows you to relive things that you've done before. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. But basically, there's a point of the game where something happens. You can't go back for a while. And then eventually, they're like, okay, if you want to go back, you can do it through this Testament of the Soul. It's almost like time traveling. You go back and you can do stuff that you missed out on. Basically, that's the point. If you ever need help. Now, once we exit the house, one of the things is you can call in your horse. You just uh, In my case, you just press left on D-pad. Wow. And you can just like run around on your horse. Like I've said, traversal is actually one of the better aspects of the game, which is really cool. As you're running around through the open world, you can collect materials, which you can then use to craft at shopkeepers and whatnot. This isn't really like super complex stuff, but just be aware that there are some neat things that you can do with like, oh, let me see if I can get up here. No, we actually can't jump on top of this one. But basically the idea is you can glide and then go from a glide into horse let me just go ahead and go over here so at any point in time as you are falling you can hit the glide button and then from there you can just call out your horse and seamlessly transition into galloping which is pretty nice it's nice traversal is nice all of that stuff but um essentially i guess one of my final tips would be as you are playing through the game You'll eventually run into a situation where, say for instance, you're trying to get a certain combat style. And let's say I would look at this Kia Tai style and I would say, oh, it's Fugitive X on zone something, right? Let's say the Fugitive would be in this zone, which is Kojimachi, right? But you're looking at the map and there's no Fugitives there. What you need to do is you just go to the map and start doing literally anything, any of the open world activities. The more open world activities you do, the more open world things will start getting revealed and eventually you will get the fugitive not just the fugitive but all of the other activities in case you're just trying to complete the map and all of that stuff but um yeah at this point i feel like this video has already gone on long enough hopefully this helped you understand some of the basic mechanics of um rise of the ronin also important thing uh your horse uh, is going to give you passive benefits as well. So you will want to upgrade your horse as well as upgrade the tack, which is basically the saddle of your horse. And you can do that in uh, Horse Dudes. Where's Horse Dudes? There's a Horse Dude right here. I'm going to teleport. You can do that at these Horse Dudes or stables or whatever. Like if you speak with this person. She will let you buy a new horse, and as you can see, the horse has, like, stats, like, right there. Aiming speed, 18%, mounted secondary attack, horse stamina, etc. Then you have the lacquer attack, which in itself also has stats. So these will be things that you'll want to consider okay. for your character. And also, consider that if you're planning on, like me, using uh, mostly one weapon, use your secondary weapon as a stat stick, because the stuff does appear to count. So, like, right here, we have the trusted leader set bonus, but this is not really optimized right now, because I was just, like, doing the guide. 
but you can go ahead and say, actually, I want to have Master Strategist. You can just equip this katana to get that, or I want to get Master Strategist. You can equip these duels. You can equip Matchless Master and get additional bonuses out of it. So, you know, you can use this as a stat stick. Same thing for sub-weapons, same thing for armor and other things, but... Yeah, this video has gone on long enough. If this helped you in any way, hit that like button, subscribe, bell notification icon, all of that jazz. Hopefully you guys will enjoy the series that I have coming for Rise of the Ronin. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe, peace out.